Bruchem Aboim. Welcome to our home. Again, thank you for attending. Yeah, this week, on my thoughts, I'd like to examine the statement that serve God always in all ways. This is a statement which I heard from a newscaster on Newsmax. This statement raises really a question. Can we truly connect our service of God Almighty to all facets of our lives? So is serving God in all ways a possibility or is it just a catchy phrase? You know, in the fifth book of the Torah, in the portion of Kisavo, it states, Vahalakta Bidrachov, which translates to mean, and you shall go in his ways. Now, what exactly does the statement mean to go in the ways of God? I believe that it is our mission in life to emulate God. Now, the way that we can fulfill our mission is, of course, by serving him always and in all ways. God, our Father in heaven, has given us his most precious possession, his Torah, an instruction manual to guide us so that we know exactly what he considers important, a sort of GPS, God-positioning satellite, designed for us to better navigate our journey in life. You know, the Medrash tells us, based on the words in the portion of Genesis, And God said, let us make man. This verse is telling us that God Almighty conferred with the angels before he created man. This was done to teach us that when a, an executive makes a decision, that he should include his employees into the decision process. By doing so, his action will make them more productive since they will feel like an important part of the team. That is in addition to the necessity for a person to learn to delegate something that is a necessity only for man, not for God. Now, shortly after God created Adam, first man, he created a mate for him, Chava. It is said in the Medrash that not only did God create Chava, it was he who brought her under the chuppah, under the marriage canopy, so that they could be bound in matrimony as husband and wife. It was God Almighty himself who adorned her with the 24 gifts that are presented to a kala, to a bride on her wedding day. In addition, he was the Masada Kedushin. He was the official who performed the marriage ceremony. Now, all of these actions were conducted personally by God, our beloved Father in heaven, so that we can learn to appreciate that marriage is an integral part of life, a catalyst for us to grow, as it states, so to speak, a match made in heaven. King David, Dovin Amalek stated in Psalm 16:8, She visi Hashem lefani tamid, the pardon me, lenegdi tamid. I have set God before me always. What is it that David is telling us? For one, I believe that he is telling us that he perceived God as a reality, a Father, who was always with him, not just in theory but a true feeling of his existence, a feeling that wasn't limited to, to just the synagogue or the study hall, a feeling that existed in every place and in everything that he did. He felt the presence of God's watchful eye watching over him constantly. Now, in his Torah, God has taught, has taught us about the concept of forgiveness. In the book of Genesis, it states that on the same day that Adam and Chava were created, they sinned. On that same day, they repented, and then God forgave them for their sin. So we see right from the beginning of creation, God Almighty was teaching us that sinning is an inevitability, but that repentance is always a possibility. From Adam and Kabbalah, we learn that the gates of repentance are always open. We also learn that forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. We read in the Torah in the opening verses of the portion of Ayera, that it is a mitzvah, a commandment to visit the sick. The portion begins with God Almighty coming down to earth to visit Abram Rabino, Abraham our father. This was on the third day of the circumcision. The lesson that we learn from this story is that visiting the sick is an even greater mitzvah than hosting the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, God Almighty himself. 
We also read in his Torah in the portion of Bayera that before God Almighty destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, it states, Er don know the ere, that I will go down now and see. So Rashi commenting on his word states, these words are meant to teach judges that they should not decide cases where life and death are at stake unless they have first seen the evidence themselves. So as a lesson for us, it states that God Almighty first came down to earth to view firsthand the sins of Sodom before he administered their punishment. You know, another concept that we learn in the portion of Chayasura, where we are introduced to the importance of the ritual of mourning and burial. The first time that burial is mentioned in the Torah is with Sarah Imenu, Sarah, our mother. She passes away and her husband, Avraham purchases the cave of the Machpelah so that he can give her a proper burial. In addition, we read in the first book of the Torah about the death and burials of our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then at the end of the portion of Ayachi, we read that Yosef dies. The Egyptians place his casket into the Nile. We are told that before the children of Israel leave Egypt, Moshe retrieves his casket. Yosef's casket accompanied the nation for the 40 years that they traveled in the desert. When they entered the land, he was laid to rest in the city of Shechem in the land of Israel, where it still resides until today. Our sages tell us, as it stays in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Ben Azai said, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, that one good deed brings on another good deed. We observe that Yosef, the greatest individual of his generation, buries his father, Yaakov of Avino, in the Machpelah. Then, when the children of Israel leave Egypt, it is Moshe himself, the greatest individual of his generation, who retrieves the casket of Yosef, so that it can be, could be buried in the land of Israel. The Torah ends with the death of Moses, our teacher. Our sages tell us that it was God Almighty himself who buried Moshe, the greatest individual who ever lived. We read in the portion of Vayetze that God showed hospitality to Yaakov Vino when he was traveling on his way to Lopan's house to marry a wife. The verse states that on his journey, that he spent the night there, meaning the Temple Mount, because the sun had already set. Then we read in the next verse that words, Ki ba Hashemesh, because the sun had set. Rashi commenting on these words stated that these words imply that the sun set suddenly for him, meaning not at its regular time, so that he should be compelled to spend the night there. So unknowingly, he had spent the night sleeping on the site of the Temple God's house. So we read that God orchestrated events in nature so that Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, would be ob obliged to spend the night with him on the mountain, hospitality. You know, in the portion of Kisisa, the Torah records what we call the Yud Gimel Mido Tarachamim, the 13 attributes of mercy that God Almighty has taken upon himself when he created his world. These 13 attributes direct us as to how we should conduct our daily lives. They begin with God's name of mercy, repeated twice. Rashi explains that the first mention of God's name of mercy alludes to a person before they have sinned. And then the second mention is an allusion to the person after they have sinned. The verse continues with additional attributes that God has taken upon himself. God was merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness, and truth. The next verse continues with the attributes of keeping mercy unto the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And the verse then ends with the Hebrew word, benakeh, which according to Rashi means that God does not overlook, overlook a sin completely, but that when he does punish for it, he does so little by little. All of this is done in the hope that the sinner will repent and that he will reconnect with his relationship with his Father in heaven. In addition, these 13 attributes direct us on how we should act and react in our daily personal relations with other people. 
We read in the Torah that in many places in Tanakh that God Almighty is concerned about the feelings of converts, as it states in the portion of Mishpatim. Do not hurt the feelings of a convert or oppress him, for you too were foreigners in the land of Egypt. He continues in the next verse, do not mistreat a widow or an orphan. God Almighty is constantly concerned about the poor and downtrodden. This information is to instruct us that we too should do the same and that we should emulate his example. So how are we able to serve God always and in all ways? This can only be achieved by really realizing that there is no place or thing that does not connect to him. From the moment that we wake up in the morning, we connect with our Father in heaven. We begin our day with the words, Moda'ani, I offer thanks to you for returning my soul. His name should constantly be on our lips. We learn this fact from Yosef, who wherever he was and whatever he did, God's name was always on his lips. In fact, we witnessed that the Torah testifies in the portion of Vayeshev that God was always with Yosef and that God granted Yosef success in everything that he did. There is no place or time that we are not connected with God our Father in heaven. Whether we are at work, exercising, relieving ourselves, eating, even recreating, we need to make a conscious effort to include God Almighty in all of our activities. There should be no place devoid of Him. Before we begin our work day, we need to ask Him to make us successful, not only for our own personal gratification, but in the hope that we can acquire the financial means to be able to serve Him properly, as it states in Pirkei Avos, the Ethics of the Fathers. Rebbe Lozman Azaria said, "Im ain't Kemach, ain't Torah that if there's no flower, then there cannot be any Torah. Success, success is God's domain. All that we contribute is the effort. God expects us to participate with him in all that we do. You know, the last word stated in the Torah in the connection with the creation of the world is la asot, to do. This is a world of action. We do not have the permission to be spectators. When we exercise, even before we begin, we should ask God to give us good health and the strength to be able to perform our exercises. How long we will live? Well, that's totally in God's hands. However, how well we will live physically is many times and in many ways in our hands. We see that even exercising can be a mitzvah, especially if we use our health to learn Torah and perform mitzvot. Basically, we should take nothing for granted. Even when we have, pardon me, even when we leave a restroom, we shouldn't assume that all of our plumbing is functioning properly. We thank God Almighty by reciting a special blessing for the miracle of being able to retain all that our bodily, all of our bodily fluids, and that at the same time being able to eliminate all the waste products that our body produces. Without the ability to do so, well, we would die a torturous death. When we eat any food or drink, there is always a blessing that we recite before we begin. We are in essence asking God's permission to partake of his bounty. We're saying please. After we conclude our meal, we articulate an after blessing saying thank you to God Almighty for the food that sustains our existence. However, making the blessing, well, that is just an introduction. We need to connect our meal to our service of God. We need to thank him for the strength that we derive from the food so that we can better serve him properly. Even when we recreate, we should do so with the intent of putting our minds and bodies in a healthy and peaceful state of mind, as it states in Psalm 100. Ivdu es Hashem besimcha. Serve God with joy. As the saying goes, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This proverb is telling us that without time off from work, a person can become bored and boring. Serving God is not a part-time job. We serve him with everything and anything that we possess. You know, I remember when I first became a Baal Tshuva, a returning Jew, so to speak, I wondered, what should I major in? I found that the answer was that you major in nothing, but that you minor in everything. 
When I initially became an Orthodox Jew, I took my guitar, put it in a case, and placed it in my closet. I thought that the guitar and the music that I played had no place in my service of God. But then I was informed by my original mentor, Ramosha Poulter, of blessed memory, that the Rebbe, or Menachem Mendel Schneerson of blessed memory, instructed his followers that there is no talent that a person possesses that cannot be used in the service of God. After hearing the Rebbe's words, I took my guitar out of the closet, and sure enough, I was able to use music as a vehicle to connect to God, my Father in Heaven. He, had, he has inspired me to write Hebrew songs that connect to my prayers and my life experiences. Songs with titles such as, I Love Hashem, Torah Man, and Serve God with Joy, just to name a few. So the bottom line, serving God Almighty should not be viewed as an exercise limited to the synagogue or the study hall. It does not have to be recited out of a book or, or even a scroll. It can and should originate from the depths of our hearts and our souls and from there permeate into every part of our bodies. There should be no thought, no action that is devoid of God and his presence. Again, let me end this thought with a prayer that God Almighty should bring about a victorious end to the war in Gaza with the release of all the hostages. May he heal all those that are injured, console all the mourners, and return all of our brave soldiers together with the coming Mashiach Sakenu quickly in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, please make sure to push like and subscribe and share if you would. Again, all that is helpful. Again, God should bless you, keep you safe, healthy, and successful. Again, thank you for attending. Again, there will be a next portion, which will include an original song that I've written. Uh, please stand by. Thank you. God bless. Shabbat Shalom.